Alô? All right, we are back. No bumper that time. All right, welcome back. This is session number two of the sessions on the history of stereoscopic photography at the 47th 3D Con. We have three presenters in this session, followed by a question and answer period. Starting us off is Professor Patrick Luber coming to us from the University of North Dakota. He will speak on the under-researched topic of Viewmaster Reels in Selective Ignorance on Comfortable Visions of America in Viewmaster Stereographs. Next, we have a paper from Ms. Shannon Moeni, Ms. Leslie James, and Ms. Hannah Fuller. Ms. Moeni and Ms. Fuller will present from Library Archives on Big Breath, Navigating the Atlantic in 3D, Digitizing Domenico Danzero's Original 1900-1901 Stereograph Cards at Missouri State University. And following, we will have independent scholar, Dr. Peter Blair, concluding the session with a time-bending talk on the Outlander effect or popular culture at Scottish tourist sites. For Professor Luber's presentation, please. Sorry, sorry Melody, I, sorry, can I, uh, I just wanted yeah, yeah. to, since we're coming back from break, I wanted to uh, just share the screen and show um, show the web page for the session. Yeah. Uh, right, so if you go to the web page and if you go to sessions on history of stereo uh, uh, photography here, now we're moving in the first, in the first session uh, we, we, we did the leak lease in, in the first session, so we're going to be moving on to, uh, to that item. And then if you want to view the supplemental uh, second screen experience, you can click here. And we want to point out that um, 2D information is not going to be there, and some, some information is not going to show up on that screen. And also just to say many of these images are cropped and formatted from vintage stereo cards while preparing and aligning for modern devices. Efforts have been made to preserve the artist's original intent. However, this second screen gallery is not intended to replace the experience of viewing the physical stereo card. 
So I didn't mean to put that on my screen, but that's what I was reading. So Thank back you to you, Melanie. Melanie. Yeah. For Professor Luber's presentation, please use your anaglyph viewer. We're anaglyph at this point. Correct me if I get things mixed up. I'm trying my best to keep the different media separate. Miss uh, Professor Luber, you may share your screen. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, yes, most of my images are in mono, although the last three images are in anaglyph. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to do somewhat of a straight read today, and then uh, because of time. Now, it looks like he froze. Patrick, are you with us? You're frozen. Seems like the Zoom gods are not with us today. It's already two. Um, hmm. Let us... Patrick, I don't know. Let's give him a second or two and see if he comes on. Patrick, are you with us? Patrick? It looks okay. like he just dropped out of the he's, Zoom. Hopefully he's he'll probably be able dropping to out to come back in. Let's give <clears> him a minute, okay? I think we have to write Zoom, huh, Dave? Yep. Uh, to put the countdown clock on and we can have another break. <laughs> In case you didn't get everything Everybody's done. Everybody's back break. with their sandwiches. I think we're okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is he on, Dave? Can you see? Uh, I don't. I don't see him. All right. I think we should probably move on to the next speaker and then recap him. The, uh, we have been, excuse us audience, we have been having Zoom glitches that I haven't experienced at all this year and I don't I don't know maybe it is Friday the 13th what do you think <laughs> yeah this 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 seems like a case of uh his internet connection probably dropped on his end oh thanks Eric okay so let's give him I'm sure he'll be back all right let's move on sorry for this guys we we'll just hang on we'll get it all worked out at the end all right um, now we will go on to Ms. Nawini and Ms. Fuller. I hope you are ready. Please have for this talk both your lorgnette and your anaglyph viewer. Um, uh, Ms. Nawini and Ms. Fuller, you may share your screen. Right. Okay, I am Shannon Mwini. I'm the digital archivist for Missouri State University. Uh, Leslie James, archivist for Missouri State Archives, contributed the majority of the research uh, on Domino Danzero, and I'll be reading a lot of her information here. And uh, Hannah Fuller was our history intern here at Missouri State University, and she is now a master's uh, student in the history department. In 2009, the Domino Danzero photograph collection was part of a collaborative effort of digital access and physical preservation with the Missouri State Archives and Missouri State University Special Collections and Archives. Over a thousand Missouri related images were digitized and became part of the online catalog of collections through Missouri Digital Heritage with the Missouri Secretary, Secretary of State's office. The physical collection with additional photos taken outside of Missouri totaling 11 cubic feet was donated by Domino's granddaughter to Missouri State University Special Collections and Archives in Springfield, Missouri. Domenico or Domino Danzero was born January 13, 1871 near Turin, Italy. At the age of 16, he entered the monastery but quickly realized monastic life was not for him. Uh, he apprenticed as a tailor but didn't enjoy that either. At the age of 19, in the early 1890s, he immigrated to the United States 
He made at least one trip back to Italy in 1900 to 1901, during which he experimented with stereoscopic photography. It is not known exactly when Domino took up the hobby of photography, but some of the earliest photographs within the collection date between 1891 and 1895. Domino used an Alvista camera number 4B produced by the Multiscope and Film Company for many of his early panoramic photographs. In 1900, he was able to manip manipulate the camera to allow him to pose himself multiple times in one panoramic image, a process he sold to Kodak for $200. Domino took various jobs as he moved across the country. He worked at a coal mine in Illinois as a chef in Chicago and for a bakery in St. Louis before becoming a chef for the Harvey House restaurant chain with the Frisco Railroad around 1899. As a chef and later a supervisor, he also used his amateur photography skills to help document the environment and communities along the rail line between St. Louis and Galveston, Texas. He was even given special permission by the railroad to stop any train he was on for the purpose of photographing an area. Domino met his future wife through his travels uh, for Harvey House and the Frisco. He married Bridget Roetta, 10 years his junior, in August 1902. The couple eloped to St. Louis due to Bridget's family being leery of this older man. Bridget would become Domino's business associate during their 50 years of marriage, helping with the various businesses he founded. The Danzeros had a home in Rogers, Arkansas for a few years in the early 1900s before deciding to settle in Springfield, Missouri, where Missouri State University is located, in 1907. After over a decade of service to Harvey House, Domino became president of Taunty Town Wine and Fruit Distilling Company in 1906. Then in Springfield started Domino's Cafe in 1908, Domino's Bakery in 1910, and Domino's Macaroni in 1918. The Macaroni Factory was, quote, the biggest supplier of macaroni from Chicago to the southwest part of the nation. Sometime in 1923, at the age of 52, Domino received news from his doctor that he had a terminal case of diabetes and would not likely live another year. Having already sold the cafe, they decided to liquidate their assets in the bakery and macaroni factory. The unexpected early retirement followed the, or allowed the family to travel and allowed Domino to focus on smaller entrepreneurial projects and his hobby of photography. They and their two daughters, Leola and Angelina, took extended trips to the Western US in 1923 and 1925, both of which are well-documented in the photograph collection. Domino and Bridget would also take a six month trip to Europe in 1931. In 1935, Domino set up shop in the basement of his home and manufactured the Domino food products line. His products included things like hot tamales, ravioli, chop suey, mayonnaise, spaghetti sauce, chili, salad dressings, and glue, which family members described as the worst smelling product of them all. Domino passed away December 18, 1952, almost 30 years after doctors gave him only months to live. It is said that in his later years, his eyesight was poor and he longed to be able to look at his photograph collection again. In 2020, Domino's granddaughter donated another small batch of photos taken by Domino in the format of stereoscope cards. Domino experimented with various forms of photography, including stereoscopic photography, on a trip back to his hometown in Italy in 1900 to 1901. He also did some hand tinting of photographs, including a bid in some of the stereoscope cards. The collection included 26 images total, taken both on the ship and in Italy. The donor wanted to retain the originals, so she was loaning them to us for digitization. We could have just scanned these and put the original scans online as is, and we could have made reproductions to be viewed in a stereoscope on, Skype, on site, which we do have. But we wanted users to easily see the images three-dimensionally as intended, as well as remotely, especially during a pandemic. So we turned to the National Stereoscopic Association members uh, for help with suggestions on how to do this. We knew we would scan the originals on our flatbed scanner, which was actually simple in this case because the cards were flat instead of curved like many commercially produced ones are. However, the images on the cards appeared to be hand cut and glued down, so the edges were not always straight or even, which did present a little difficulty. The advice we received from the NSA was to use Stereo Photo Maker Pro. They also suggested offering the images, maybe I should say you uh, suggested <laughs> uh, offering the images in multiple formats, as some people are able to see one format better than another. We also included wiggles, which are not technically three-dimensional viewing, but we decided to include them for accessibility, uh, since not everyone can see images in stereo, such as those with low or no vision in one eye. We also ran into an issue with ContentDM, our content management platform, that it couldn't display animated GIFs, which was not something we had needed to do prior to this project. So we ended up using Photoshop to create short video versions instead. 
This became a great self-contained project for our wonderful intern that semester, Hannah Fuller. Uh, when we have smaller projects like this, we like having our students and interns work on them, giving them the opportunity to see a project from beginning to end. The project once finished was uploaded to Missouri State University's digital collections, as well as ingested from there to the Digital Public Library of America via Missouri Hub. And now for the hard part, uh, Hannah will tell you about her process. All right, hello, I'm Hannah. I'm the aforementioned intern and I'm going to be talking today about uh, the process that I utilize to turn uh, the photo, the stereoscope scans into all of our different formats uh, and just briefly go over over how we did that. So we started the digitization process with Photoshop after everything was scanned and uploaded. We only utilize Photoshop for the creation of our GIFs or the wiggles as they're also called. Um, like Shannon mentioned, although, the, although these aren't technically uh, in the three actual 3D format, they were the most accessible way to view the images in 3D in a 3D-like effect at home. Um, the process of turning the scans into the GIF was time consuming, but ultimately pretty user friendly using Photoshop. This was my first time ever editing extensively with Photoshop, so I was new to the process, but it all came pretty easily once you figured it out. Um, I'd be happy to provide a step by step if people wanted more information, they're welcome to reach out about it, but in the interest of time, just to give a brief overview, the process basically involved cutting the stereoscopes into the respective left and right sides, um, editing out the background to be a little bit more precise, and then overlaying the images, so in the GIF as it switches in between the two, you get the uh, illusion of depth. Um, the key really to the editing process for this was just to be precise as is possible when overlaying the left and right sides. And this could prove difficult sometimes, as Shannon mentioned, because the images were hand cut. So sometimes the scans of the cards themselves, the left and the right side were different. Um, and that takes out the 3D effect a little bit. Um, like she mentioned as well in the end, video files had to be utilized, but the process was still useful to go through and learn. And uh, it was that initial creation of the GIF that eventually led to the, uh, the video animation as well. So from there, after we made all the GIFs with Photoshop, we utilized Stereo Photo Maker Pro, which is a free program with multiple formats available, as I'm sure many of you are probably familiar with. We utilized it to create anaglyphs, universal view, cross-eye images, and also GIFs as well. The layout uh, of Stereo Photo Maker Pro isn't quite as straightforward. A lot of the controls aren't labeled, so you have to play around with the program a little bit to figure out what everything does. But ultimately, it was much less time consuming and produced really strong results um, from what we had available. The biggest thing that saved time with Stereo Photo Maker is that uploading the separate sides of the stereoscope was ultimately unnecessary. You could just upload the whole scan of the card and the program would cut it in half for you and automatically align it. So that took out not only a lot of the time that Photoshop uh, caused it to take up, but also a lot of the user error uh, involved in well with hand editing down the images. So creating anaglyph images with Stereo Photo Maker Pro, you're welcome to put on your glasses if you'd like to view the image, but the process was fairly simple. You just uploaded the image, it automatically cut it, aligned it, and then it created your anaglyph for you. And we've got that displayed up there. So next we have the free viewing formats that we created. This first one is gonna be creating the universal view. Again, it's just the same process. You just upload, it automatically aligns it, and then you select your desired output and that gives you the, the free view there of the universal view, which you can view with your viewer or if you'd like to go the old fashioned way and try to look off into the distance and cross your eyes and bring it downwards, you can do that as well. And then finally, we have the cross eye images uh, for the last free viewing. Um, Again, you can go ahead and put on your viewers if you'd like. You can stick out your finger and cross your eyes if you'd like to do that as well. Uh, same process as well for creating these. It's all the same on Stereo Photo Maker. You just upload, it automatically aligns it, overlays it for you, and you just select your desired output and you have a, have a cross-eye image. We also utilize Stereo Photo Maker Pro to create the GIFs as well as the wiggles to compare the two between uh, Photoshop and Stereo Photo Maker Pro. We've got one uploaded there playing uh, very slowly for you, so hopefully you can see that a little bit with the 3D effect. Um, but if you'd like to view it on our digital collections website, I would encourage you to do that as well. 
Um, creating GIFs on Stereo Photo Maker Pro, as I mentioned earlier, was a lot less time consuming than it took on Photoshop. And oddly, it created more precise GIFs than I was able to make my, by myself hand editing on Photoshop. Again, I think this was largely just because it cuts out the user error and the automatic alignment of the images it really creates a, a precise overlaying of the left and right sides, which gives you a stronger uh, 3D effect. So conclusions, Photoshop versus Stereo Photo Maker Pro. As I've mentioned over and over again throughout uh, my section here, Stereo Photo Maker Pro ultimately was a lot less time consuming and produced a very strong, if not equal results that were, yeah. Um, and then also the Stereo Photo Maker Pro has the benefit of creating all the multiple formats. You can not only create GIFs with it, but you can create the anaglyphs, the universal view, anything you need. Um, best viewing format for the images. Ultimately, it's going to depend on the materials and resources of your organization. GIF and Anaglyph ultimately produce the most consistent 3D effect I found. Um, GIF, you're going to be able to view it in that 3D-like format anytime at home. You don't you can view it if you don't have if you have vision impediments um, and then anaglyph of course is just going to produce a very strong 3d result you just have to have the 3d glasses um, and not everyone is going to have those at home at least general public wise uh, gif cross eye and universal were ultimately the most uh, accessible ways to view the images just because you don't need any additional equipment to do that but cross eye and universal do come as well with that practice if you don't have the viewer and the, the user error of having to learn how to view those at home um, so ultimately they can all serve you it really just depends on on the goals of your project and the the people that are going to be viewing your materials and that concludes our presentation thank you so much Thank you so much, Ms. Fuller and Ms. Mooney. That was fascinating. I'm like taking notes here and doing a million things. That's great. Um, really nice archival work. I love saying that. All right, next up, we have Dr. Peter Blair. Um, and for his presentation, you may use your lorgnette viewer. Dr. Blair, you may share your screen. Get start video. Here I'm and share screen. Adam. We can see it. Very good. Not you up and running. Good. Well, thanks, Melody, and uh, hello, Outlander fans. I uh, hope you're ready for um, some time travel. Uh, the series Outlander was filmed on location in Scotland, and in fact, there was a huge boost to Scottish tourism uh, from fans that wanted to visit the locations in the flesh. And um, I'm going to show you a selection of these places during my talk using antique stereo views from my collection. And one such location is Dune Castle, which Outlander fans will of course recognize as Castle Leoch. Uh, the National Trust for Scotland reports that visitor numbers have more than tripled to uh, Dune Castle prior to the pandemic. And indeed, We've seen similar effects at other uh, locations associated with Outlander. And it's been so significant that a phrase has been coined to describe the phenomenon, and that is the Outlander effect. Dune Castle uh, has also been used for filming of, games of Game of Thrones, and memorably, uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail where John Cleese hurled abuse at the Crusaders uh, in an outrageous French accent. I thought in your general direction, your mother was a hamster and your father smelt of elderberries. Meanwhile, over in Edinburgh, nowadays you can't move in the back alleys 
and courtyards of the Royal Mile in the Old Town because of guided tours of Outlander fans, because this is where the, uh, this area was used to represent uh, 18th century Edinburgh in the series. And it was the site of Jamie's print shop. But the Outlander effect is not a new phenomenon. Scotland has a long tradition of literature and the arts inspiring tourism. For example, in Old Edinburgh, the Outlander fans will be jostling for space with the Harry Potter fans on similar tours. And JK Rowling took uh, much inspiration from the city uh, when she was writing her books. And in particular, from the gravestones in Greyfriars Churchyard. They provided her with names for several characters, such as Moody, McGonagall, and even Potter himself. And we probably shouldn't even mention the grave of Tom Riddle, otherwise known as Lord Voldemort. Right next door to Greyfriars is George Heriot's school, which was founded in 1628 as a charitable school for underprivileged children. Its towers and turrets uh, were supposed to have inspired uh, Rowling's vision of Hogwarts. And just round the corner, the attractive Victoria Street curves down off the Royal Mile and provided inspiration for Diadem Alley, or so they say. And this is a great view by Archibald Burns who was Edinburgh's foremost stereo photographer from the mid 1960s onwards. Just a few miles south of Edinburgh, we find the 15th century Roslyn Chapel. It's an architectural jewel full of rich, mysterious stone carvings and symbols. And it became famous as the setting for the denouement of the book and film, The Da Vinci Code. Visitor numbers went ballistic and it allowed the construction of a visitor center and cafe and it paid for major roof repairs. Queen Victoria visited the chapel in 1842 and she found it very dilapidated and requested it should be saved for the nation. So repairs were undertaken and this is a view of the Masons by George Washington Wilson in 1860. It reopened as a place of worship for Easter 1862. Prior to the pandemic, I was helping Roslyn with plans to install a 3D display of old stereo views in the visitor center. They were delighted to see my collection of old stereo views because apparently some visitors believe the chapel was only built a few years ago as a stage set for the Da Vinci Code film. So demonstrating that it was a tourist attraction over 150 years ago is important. And they also document changes over time. For example, this view by Wilson from around 1860, you can see has clear glass in the windows. Whereas this view from a similar spot taken around 1870 by Thompson of Roslyn has stained glass. And we know that the stained glass was started to be installed in 1867. So I hope that this uh, 3D project will come back to life again, but sadly the pandemic has forced a complete rethink on interactive displays. The most striking historic example of the Outlander effect is the work of Sir Walter Scott. He was the best-selling author of his day, a sort of early 19th century Diana Galbadon, Gabaldon. And Scott's credited with inventing the historical novel. And so Outlander can be seen as a direct descendant of his work. Scott created a romantic vision of Scotland, which still influences tourism to this day. And he was also essentially responsible for all the tartan paraphernalia that blankets it. His classics like Ivanhoe and Rob Roy pulled in the visitors, especially to the beautiful area of lochs and mountains known as the Trossachs, where special stagecoach 
and paddle steamer tours were very popular. One of the must-see sites was the mystic Ellen's Isle, captured by George Washington Wilson in this iconic image. This was the home of Ellen, the eponymous Lady of the Lake from Scott's famous epic poem. These sort of um, references in stereoscopic images would have been blindingly obvious to the Victorians, but are sometimes more difficult for us to decipher today. But even if we're not familiar with the literature, we can still enjoy the scenery. And an old steamship called the Sir Walter Scott still plies the loch. And it's a beautiful excursion. I would particularly recommend hiring a bike and taking it on the steamer to the end of the loch and cycling back. So you can see that the Outlander effect is merely the latest in a continuous historical spectrum of media-inspired tourism, where the star has always been the dramatic beauty of Scotland's landscape, like the bleak valley of Glencoe, which features in the title sequences of Outlander. It was also the location of Hagrid's hut in the Harry Potter films, and was recently the location of James Bond's childhood home in the film Skyfall. And this is one of the earliest views of Glencoe by Frith from 1856. And Francis Frith made a major tour of Scotland uh, in 56, and really uh, to perfect his technique before he headed off uh, to Egypt for which is, uh, is more famous. Glencoe also featured in the films Braveheart, Rob Roy, Highlander, The Outlaw King, Mary Queen of Scots, and even a Bollywood extravaganza, Kuch Kuch Hota Hai, which I am afraid I've not seen. But now I'd like to go back and focus on Outlander and visit a few of the locations used in the filming. Uh, the Devil's Pulpit in Finnick Glen is used in the first season as St Ninian's Spring, which is also known as Liar's Spring, where Dougal asks Claire to drink from the spring to test her trustworthiness. Holyrood Palace uh, played itself in Outlander. It's where Jamie and Claire met Bonnie Prince Charlie. And this is a striking image by Lachenal and Favre, uh, in a nice glass view. Linlithgow Palace is just west of Edinburgh, and it was the birthplace of the tragic Mary Queen of Scots in 1542. She became queen when she was only six days old and also became queen of France for a short while, but she spent the last 20 years of her life in captivity and, and was beheaded by her cousin, Queen Elizabeth of England at the age of only 44. In Outlander, Linlithgow Palace was used to represent Wentworth Prison where Jamie is tortured by Captain Black Jack Randall. The imposing ruin of Craig Miller Castle uh, near Edinburgh became Ardsmuir Prison in the series. In season three, Jamie is imprisoned under the eye of Lord John Gray. In the first season of Outlander, the Glasgow City Chambers on George Square are used to represent the register office of the city of Westminster, where Claire and Frank get married. And in season three, the um, old college at Glasgow University stood in for Harvard University. Glasgow University was founded in 1451. It's the second oldest in Scotland after St. Andrews. And interestingly, since the late 16th century, Scotland has had four universities, while England only had two until the 19th century. The crypt 
in Glasgow Cathedral is used as the Hôpital des Anges in Paris, where Claire is both a nurse and a patient in season two. Also in season two, Dean Castle in Kilmarnock Ayrshire became Beaufort Castle, which was the seat of Clan Fraser of Lovett. And again in season two, Drumlanrig Castle became the Duke of Sandringham's estate named Bellhurst Manor with the exterior and some interior rooms used as settings. And it was here that Claire, Jamie and Murta had a final showdown with the Duke while Redcoats set up camp in the grounds. In season one, Carlisle Castle uh, stood in for Wentworth Prison it was used as a courtyard for Jamie and Taryn Macquarie are waiting to be hanged. And this is a charming view of it by George Washington Wilson. Perhaps most ambitiously, filming on location in Scotland, the makers of Outlander recreated the ambiance of the magnificent gardens of the Chateau de Versailles. They used Drummond Castle which is famous for its 17th century Scottish Renaissance garden with its formal terraces and fountains. And so in summary, the Outlander effect is merely the latest in a long history of tourism being boosted by literature and film. In general, it's a positive effect. Extra tourists bring in extra cash. However, there is a danger that the real stories and dramas and context of our historical places are somehow diluted and diminished and replaced with fictions if they're to be transformed into some sort of outlander theme park. The curators of these historic places have a fine line to tread. Let's hope they get the balance right. The pandemic has rendered a visit to Scotland awkward for Outlander fans. So instead, you might consider touring it virtually with my book, Scotland in 3D, a Victorian virtual reality tour. Not only will you tour the length and breadth of Scotland with over 200 full-size side-by-side stereo views um, and visit several Outlander locations, but you can also indulge in a bit of time travel as well. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Blair. Professor Luber is up. Can you stop sharing your screen, please? Thank you. So I think what's gonna happen now, I'm gonna share my screen uh, and then I'm gonna advance just so that we don't uh, tempt the Zoom uh, people and then if, if Patrick has his video on, if someone can spotlight that, share my screen. Right. So for um, Professor Luber's presentation, please have your anaglyph viewer. Professor Luber. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, um, we, Dave we can is try. gonna advance it. Go yeah. ahead, Dave. So you don't get cut out. Is that not, all right? Not, not exactly sure what happened there. <clears throat> no, nobody is. <laughs> okay. Glad you're back. Uh, not to complicate this, Dave, but do you have my do you have my latest PowerPoint where I slid the anaglyphs in there? Uh, I can switch to the anaglyphs at the end. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna do kind of a straight read today and then maybe perhaps I can fill in some gaps during question and answers. The title of this presentation is Selective Ignorance, Uncomfortable Visions of America in Viewmaster Stereographs, but it could easily have been titled Viewmaster Stereographs in the Ages of Certainty. Theories about cyclical epics of cultural certainty and doubt are explored in Thomas McEvey's book, Culture and the Culture, sculpture in the age of doubt, excuse me, sculpture in the age of doubt. But for this presentation, it has sufficed to summarize his arguments. 
Throughout recorded history, there have been cultural eras of certainty brought about by political, religious, social, or scientific ideas that over time gained widespread acceptance and are largely unquestioned. By the same token, some shift occurs within the cultural spectrum that challenges accepted beliefs, ushering in an age of doubt. The Viewmaster Library of Images supported an age of certainty by constructing a visual world through selective ignorance. I propose two ways that selective ignorance or editing is at work in the Viewmaster Library to support the certainty of Eurocentric modernist ideals for America. Slide two. The first is an older trope borrowed from 19th century American landscape painting. From its inception, the American experiment needed a historical identity, and that identity was largely constructed on what author John Davis calls geoscriptural fusion. But it wasn't until the 19th century that these ideas were fully expressed through landscape paintings. Conceptually, these images supported a Eurocentric vision of certainty and destiny based on a constructed narrative that framed the colonial Atlantic crossing as an exodus story, making America the new promised land and a divinely ordained nation. Later, which, which supported various political agendas, the belief in progress and white superiority over other races. Wondrous interpretations of the American landscape by Albert Beardstadt, slide three. Thomas Moran and Frederick Church were used to illustrate this geoscriptural narrative of the emerging American identity. With the rise of mass media, advances in photog photographic and chromolithography technology, these 19th century landscape images and their cultural meanings were widely circulated and fully codified within the American psyche by the 1940s and 50s. Slide. The Sawyer's company photographers employed similar formal visual strategy positioning the viewer in the optimal spot to capture the sublime awe of God's natural creation, especially notable in this stereograph of Niagara Falls, where the viewer is positioned near or over the water's edge. While such formal compositional strategies make dramatic stereographic images, they also serve to carry forth the geoscriptural underpinnings of the American identity to a post-war generation. Slide. Even graphic stereographs reference the compositional tropes and ideologies found in 19th century landscape paintings, as in this pairing of Daniel Boone leading the people westward. Slide. Such images of the Teton Mountains from the church with the Christian cross superimposed over the mountains left little doubt about the primacy of the geoscriptural origins of the American narrative, primacy that selectively ignored the role that slavery, indigenous genocide, and prosperity theology placed, played in creating an idyllic version of America. This image also might conjure up thoughts of Frederick Church's painting in memory of Thomas Cole. While I have yet to find definitive proof that the Sawyer's company instructed their photo photographers to copy these historic visual strategies, it seems more than a coincidence that these mimetic tropes appear throughout the li Viewmaster Library, as their photographers would have been aware of the compositional and conceptual basis of the American landscape tradition. While the Sawyer's company marketed their Viewmaster products in department stores, they were also available at tourist destinations. Tourists could relive their family pilgrimages to the sacred sites of the nation's civil religion through stereographic souvenirs. However, these images were more than just souvenirs. When consumed within a domestic environment, there was ample opportunity for family to exercise additional interpretive influence over these already, already selectively edited image and reinforce the certainty of the constructive vision of America. Slide. While the Sawyer's company selectively constructed their library of landscape images from well-established artistic strategies, they also seemed fully aware of the cultural shift after World War II as America moved from its agriculture, rural agricultural roots to an industrial and increasingly urban nation. 
While most citizens still viewed America as a divinely ordained nation, there was increased faith in human abilities, namely the belief that scientific progress could improve the lives of ordinary people. Slide. Here too, uh, selective editing projected a sense of certainty through images of progress and framed America as an innovative nation with modern factories and an innovative food production, industrialized, excuse me, food production system with a, a system that continues to the present day, albeit with growing ecological consequences. Slide. While the selectively edited Viewmaster Library of post-war America touted the wonders of scientific innovation and the belief in progress, it also reinforced the certainty of racial and gender roles based on prevailing Western uh, Eurocentric cultural attitudes. Images of industrial and agricultural advances projected a sense of pride and cultural progress, yet many images of African-Americans, Native Americans, and women were largely depicted in historically quote unquote fixed roles. Images such as this boy eating a slice of watermelon played into racial stereotypes of African-Americans. This image may elicit the childhood pleasures of eating watermelon on a hot summer day, but it also continued to subvert culinary traditions to support a Eurocentric narrative of racial control and ignored the realities of life for many African-Americans in the pre-civil rights era, a life of segregation and danger. A year after Watermelon was copyrighted, Emmett Till was lynched and segregated public facilities were commonplace. Slide. Selective editing was also present in this image of African-Americans picking cotton, suggesting that blacks were only de destined for manual labor and continued to perpetuate the association between race and slavery. While some poor blacks and whites alike still picked cotton by hand in the 1940s and 50s, only African-Americans are depicted harvesting cotton by hand, while white farmers are shown harvesting cotton with modern machines. Slide. Slant, sadly and ironically, on the same reel that we see African-Americans picking cotton, we see white Americans engaged in lakeside leisure activities, an odd juxtaposition of images often seen in the Viewmaster Library that further supported a specific cultural vision. Slide. This racial divide is also present on the same reel as watermelon, as we see this image titled Georgia Peaches on, on the left side here, depicting not only the wholesomeness of, and fecundity of fruit, but also of women domesticity, and presumably white culture. The association between female gender and fruit has a long tradition in the visual arts, and this trope, along with uh, the historic tradition of the male gaze, is yet another example of how selective editing supported traditional Eurocentric vision of America. Slide. In short, it is suffice to summarize that when white Americans are featured, they are usually portrayed in a positive light working in modern factories, using modern mechanized agricultural equipment, or engaged in leisure activities. Slide. Likewise, selective editing is at work in the depiction of Native Americans, usually casting them as anthropological specimens or tourist attractions. <clears throat> in this image titled, Hunters Concealed in Skin Stalked Buffalo and Bison Realm Range depict an era long gone by the 1950s. While the title of the image uses the past tense stalked, the blurring of time periods within the broader Viewmaster Library can mislead viewers into thinking that Native Americans still wore loincloths or that large herds of buffalo still roam the American West. Slide. In reality, Native Americans during this era wore mainstream Western attire. In addition, most, if not all images, there are maybe one exception, most images of Native Americans were shown in ceremonial dress um, um, or performing sacred rituals. Ceremonial dress was used for rituals and important events as it still is today. However, depicting Native Americans in only traditional clothing casts them in the role of anthropological specimens or tourist attractions. Slide. In the image Black Elk and the Four Presidents, we find a Native American stereotype as proud and wide, wise warrior 
even a bit uh, defiant. Yet the Black Hills, sacred to many tribes, has been desecrated by the Eurocentric monument tradition and industrial extraction, and ultimately reminds us of who is in charge politically, economically, and socially. The fact that Black Elk is in quotation marks in the title leaves interpretation, leaves the interpretation and veracity of this image in question. This is not the holy man Black Elk, but his son, Benjamin Black Elk, who in reality was a successful rancher and advocate for Indian rights. However, this image still ignores the modern dimension of native peoples, reinforces the pop culture image of Native Americans and underscores the complex dynamics of colonialism. Whether it be depictions of non-white Americans or modern industrial practices, the Viewmaster Library selectively edited aspects of reality. Avoiding controversial or unpleasant subject matter made good business sense for the Sawyers Company, but selectively edit, editing, whether by omission or commission, reinforced long-held cultural attitudes, ultimately perpetuating modernist beliefs of certainty, progress, and social order. While all national identities, mythologies, and cultural beliefs are powerful fusions of fact and fiction and useful tools to unite nations, they can also obscure the realities that loom within any society and for function to preserve the status quo. But selective ignorance of subject matter was a starting point in this constructed vision of America. Photography itself is inherently misleading. Although there is a degree of veracity to all photographs, photographs are not completely objective. As John Zarkarski duly noted, and I quote, photography is a system of visual editing, end quote. And all photographs are the constructions of the photographer whose vision is shaped by cultural forces. And the Sawyer's company photographers were not immune from these forces. As author Susan Sontag notes, photographs when selectively edited, and I quote, can assume a human condition or human nature shared by everyone and can deny the determining weight of history, of genuine and historically embedded difference, uh, injustices and conflicts, end quote. Additionally, Sontag, Sontag states, quote, there is an assumption that the photographer is not intervening in people's lives or places, and as such, the photographer is a super tourist and an extension of the anthropologist, end quote. In the consumption of Viewmaster stereographs, we assume the role of super tourist. First, in the detached experience, uh, first in the detached and constructed tourist experience, and relived again through the edited photographic experience, both of which are social constructs. John Urey's sociological work on tourism notes that the tourist gaze is a gaze, and here I'm quoting, constructed through signs and tourism is a collection of signs. And over time, these signs can come to define a person, thing, or place as typical, quintessential, and authentic, end quote, and ignore the realities within the non-tourist population. Urey concludes that the, quote, tourist gaze comes to constitute a closed self-perpetuating system of illusions, end quote. And Viewmaster stereographs participate in that system of illusions, creating an edited version of the world and the playful magic of stereographic images further distract us from noticing the power controls at work through these images. As a visual artist, I'm fully aware of the power of images, both positive and negative. When I look at Viewmaster stereographs, every image is filtered through my knowledge of art history, photographic theory, and the cultural constructions that shaped America. I'm equally aware that the social upheavals of the 1960s began to test the certainties of these social constructions and perhaps initiated an age of doubt. Slide. Now I struggle with Viewmaster images, such as Iowa cornfields, of knowing that the National Organization of American Rivers recently listed the Raccoon River in Iowa as the ninth most polluted river in America, largely due to industrialized agricultural practices, or knowing that irrigation using underground aquifers is not sustainable, 
or that pesticides contribute to the, to the demise of pollinating insects. Slide. Despite my support, full support of an equitable, inclusive and progressive America, I'm also human and susceptible to the power of images. On occasions, I look wistfully at these images and for a moment I'm swept up in the magic of stereoscopic illusion and the comfort of this invented visual world with perfect, perfect family vacations on the left and purple mountains majesty in the center. And, when, and where everyone frolics happily on the beach. I want to believe in the comfort of the Viewmaster world, even though I understand its deception. Perhaps the persuasive power of these images to shape a nation's vision serve as a cautionary tale for the selectively edited media world we inhabit today. Thank you. Okay, great. And we had the two images at the bottom. Uh, so you had three images which we put into anaglyphs. So let me just quick put those on my screen. They're in a different spot. And thank you for your technology wizardry. <laughs> sure. Uh, so we can just show this one sure. side by side for a couple seconds. Yeah, that's fine. Which one was this? <clears throat> that is... Uh, Lake Superior, North Shore Lake Superior. Grand Teton Mountains. And Road to Klingemans Dome. And then we'll go to an anaglyph. And then real quick, and then one more. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Luther. That was Thank you. fascinating. I just want to grab old Viewmaster reels now. <laughs> um, Glad you could make it back. Okay. Yeah, me too. Can Dave stop sharing here? Yeah, I think, yeah, Dave, you need to, can you stop share? And we can okay. take a question and answer. So I did. Face, it's little. Oh, the there we go. Very good. All right. Questions, questions, concerns, <laughs> anything you'd like to share. We're open for a question and answer period. Uh, you may unmute or raise your hand, your little hand icon, or a chat box. Is everybody zoomed out? There may be some, there may be a chat over on the YouTube channel. Okay, here's a question. This is for Hannah from Dakota. Uh, Hannah, what was the most interesting stereo you digitized from the collection? Oh, the most interesting one. Off the top of my head, I'm not. I'm not sure if it's the my favorite is uh, called uh, Three Men on a Hill," and it's of uh, their family vacation, and it's just the three of them on a hill. That one I think had one of the strongest wiggles in there. I also there's another one I can't remember the exact title of because the stereo cards are from their trip to Italy. Um, there's one of all the officers on the ship like twirling their mustaches. That's also quite good. Uh, that's another one of my favorites. So you have some of the wiggles on both your library website and also here. We have some wiggles, don't we, Dave? Some people uh, like the wiggles. Yep, on the on the on, on the, the main supplement. yeah, on the supplemental yeah. on okay. the history page, we've got a we've got a link to the entire collection. And in the collection, you can choose to view it in the different formats. Then we also have a link to a, a sample wiggle. Yeah. Everybody should know. check out the supplements. You did quite a tour. 
you did you were like really initiated by fire right <laughs> on, the, on these processes truly yes <laughs> I, know. I I did an ebook and I, I had a wonderful assistant like you. <laughs> and I just said, learn it. I got to teach. <laughs> what other questions do we have? We have Colleen raising her hand. Colleen, if you want to go ahead. Can you her unmute video. Colleen? Her video do we have is people off. unmuted? Yeah, we should okay. have Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. It said that the host wouldn't let me unmute myself, but now thank you. For okay, that. Dave. Oh no, I saw unmute everybody. Go. Um, so I I've just been over to check out the website in Missouri. So this is for you, Hannah. Hi. Um, I commend you guys for taking on that task of, of making stereos available to the public. It's a, a daunting task for sure, and it looks cool. So I see you have 26 of them, and I started through the first four, and I was checking them out, and I wanted to give you some feedback right now because um, it's, it, it's not critical of, of you guys at all, but it's to make a better experience. <laughs> um, well, first of all, it's really curious and something we can all learn from, but three out of the four first images are not in stereo. To me, it looks like the photographer has just one photograph and then he's duplicated it and made a left eye view and a right eye view, which was commonly done when stereo photographs were really popular. So um, the third out of the fourth one with the tree branches coming in front of the hilltop view is definitely uh, taken in 3D. That's the... Uh, Stereograph card of a building on a hill, definitely in 3D, but the two before it and the one after it looked to me like there's two of the same images pasted on the card. And you can see that because if you look at the background elements, uh, they should be shifted left to right in relation to the other card image and they're not, they're absolutely aligning. So that's probably why you saw some wiggles were more effective than others. Mm. So you do see that. I think it's kind of common when people love selling their stereo views that maybe they made some that weren't, but that'd be something interesting to research. And then um, the first, I like that you have the card presented in its totality first. And then from there, you move to the different ways to view it. When you get to the cross eye view on your site, it looks to me like um, for the first four anyway, they're actually parallel views, meaning they're assembled in the same orientation as the card. So the right eye view is on the right side and the left eye view is on the left side. So if it's really, if you're gonna do it in cross eye, you have to reverse them. And then have, uh, then people would follow the cross eye. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't mean to sound corrective, but I'm saying this kind of publicly so everybody can know that there's a difference also between parallel and cross eye view. And to understand that cross eye means you're like transposing the left and right images. And the parallel view is just as it is on the card. All right, thank you, Colleen. Are there any other questions? Can I make a comment? Yes. This is for Patrick. Um, I enjoyed your talk, interesting points about stereo images, but when you make parallels to Frederick Church, I think you're completely wrong. Patrick Church, I mean, I mean Frederick Church responded to the book the cosmos, where the question was put, we need someone who has sort of the eye of a painter and the brain of the scientist to go and paint the world correctly with its correct geology, meteorology, atmospheric optics, biology, everything else. And that's what he did. He wasn't a propagandist. I think you're completely wrong. But I'm a physics professor, not an art historian. But that's my take on church. And the heart of the Andes was the cinemascope of the 19th century. But you're in another world as an art professor. Oh, I, I would agree with you that that was part of Church's goal uh, that you said. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dispute that at all. But I think his images function other ways uh, or were used, I should say, culturally used other ways. And after all, Moran's paintings led to the national parks, but let's not go through all that too. Yeah. Fortunately, we're trying to we're trying to enable the chat, but I everything that I seem to be doing is not uh, it's not working. So if any of the co-hosts is able to uh, flip something and we can get the chat enabled. Meantime, I guess we have to do the, uh, the raise hand situation, unfortunately. Oops, I'll turn that off. 
I can see the chat. Can people, I don't, th I don't think non-co-hosts can type in it though. Hmm. Well, yeah. let's see. I can type in it. Uh, they don't know. Are other people not allowed to type in? That's that's what the issue is. The co-hosts and the host <laughs> can can type, but we. I go and I set it, and then it says it says everyone, and anyone directly, but it doesn't work. Why don't we have people raise hands? And then yeah, raising hands you. is good. I, I'll try it out, Dave. Why don't you look for raised hands? Yeah, you go to reactions and raise hand if you want to talk, and then we'll call on you. Somebody raised their hand. I got everybody unmuted, I think. No. Looks like, looks like Michael Kane has a, uh, has a question. <laughs> go, go ahead, Michael. Uh, you need to... Your sound. I think, I think everybody can unmute now. I just unlocked it, so try it. Thank you, Melody. Yeah, we don't have a problem with the unmuting. We have a problem with the chat still. Oh. Um, so the new master uh, mean anything other than the registration of the picture? On the view master reels, there's a date on some of them, or most of them. Do they mean anything other than the registration of the picture? Is that question directed to me? One well, who did the view so, masters. Yeah, I so maybe that is you, Patrick, but uh, I don't know. I didn't, He's breaking up, so I'm not quite sure Sorry. what his question was. But I think he asked if the date on the reel is, that one is just when it was registered or That's whether it has another meaning. Well, it was a copyright. It was a had asked the record. Yeah, it was a copyright. Yeah, North Dakota, baby. <laughs> Can you please restate the question? We're going to have to mute everybody. Yeah, we're getting some feedback. That's okay, so if you were Michael talking- Michael Kane, can you tell, say your question again, please? His question, I believe, what Patrick, if you can go ahead, you, you thought you had an idea of what he might be asking, did you? You're you're muted. They they muted everyone, so you everyone is muted now. And you, if you want to, to talk, about of, to the best of my knowledge, those are copyright um, dates. Um, when the actual photograph was taken, I guess is a whole other question. So, and in fact, it says copyright right on the reel itself. Okay, great. Thank you. Does anyone else have a? There is an unmute. I unmuted allowed people to unmute selectively. We'll see if it works. Fingers crossed. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any further questions? I think we're, we're, we're kind of breaking up here. I allowed everybody to unmute, but uh, wow, are we still here? All right, let's everybody. To, yes, I think it's to, time to, to call everybody. To <laughs> let's give a round of applause. Everybody uh, unmute. Uh, unmute if you're able to. I think we should um, give a round of applause to everyone for um, you know speaking and and your patience and putting up with our interesting Friday the thirteenth. Thank you, everyone, for participating and viewing. Well, great job, Melody and Dave Camo, for putting this on. And Melody, second year. I hope this becomes a regular thing. So.
Thank you so much, Steve. And we've lost all the video. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody go have a drink. See you later. <laughs>